The Apostle Paul tells us that we are meant to make Israel jealous. We are meant to make Israel jealous. That is the church. That is you. And that is me. So with this in mind, it is the year 2022. Nearly 2,000 years have passed since Jesus Christ gave the church the Great Commission. Since the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost and empowered the church to preach the good news. The question is, over all this time, is the church fulfilling her mandate? 2,000 years nearly. And what do we have to show? Right now I see a bunch of empty seats and I wonder about the effectiveness of the church. This morning's sermon is entitled, The Undesirable Church. The Undesirable Church. But before we look at our own personal lives and our own personal walk with the Lord, we need to deal with the church as a whole, the corporate church. Towards the end of this, we will look at our own individual hearts. But for now, we must zoom out and look at the whole body of believers. Because I want to make a comparison this morning. And there's only one entity in all of Scripture to which we can compare the church to. And that is the nation of Israel. And this has been done many times before, I'm sure, but it is worth repeating. In order to understand the failings of the church in the year 2022, we need to understand the failings of Israel. We need to understand the failings of Israel. You've heard it said before that history repeats itself. This is also true in a spiritual sense. Why Israel? If not for Israel, we would not have received Jesus Christ. It was through this nation, this tiny nation, that God made covenants and promises that would enable the redemption of all mankind. Us, being the church by extension, as recipients of this gift, we are tasked with taking this good news to both Jew and Gentile. Romans chapter 11 ties the church and believing Israel together, unified by faith through Christ Jesus. Amen. But more on this later. First, we need to understand Israel's failings. And the most obvious place to start, and the only thing we will look at this morning for sake of time, is idolatry. This is what Israel was most guilty of. Idolatry. From the gods of Egypt to the golden calf in the wilderness, the gods of Assyria, Samaria, Babylon, Persia, Greece and Rome, and all manner of pagan practices in between, each and every one of these things tempted Israel away from her God. Why were they tempted by these things? Because these things satisfied their flesh and dulled their spirits. You see, when your spirit is dulled and your flesh is satisfied, there is no restricting law and there is no accountability to your Creator. Israel got so bad that at one point they even sacrificed their own children on the altar by fire to these foreign gods. Yes, idolatry was Israel's greatest downfall, for their rebellion was both murderous and vile in the eyes of the Lord. And yet, and here's the gospel, church, God still made a way for his people through the person of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 33 verse 15 says, In those days and at that time I will cause a righteous branch 
to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. That righteous branch is Jesus Christ. Cast your mind forward to Romans chapter 11 with the olive tree. You have the natural branches being Israel and the cultivated branches who are grafted in being the church, the Gentiles. But yet without this righteous branch, that olive tree would not be holy. This, a vivid picture of Israel's idolatry and God's reaction can be read in Ezekiel chapter 8 and chapter 9. We will just deal with chapter 8 this morning. The prophet Ezekiel was shown a vision of Israel's idolatry while captive in Babylon. Yes, that Babylon, the very epicenter of idol worship and filth. A place God's people were given over to as punishment in captivity for the very same thing we are speaking about, idolatry. You see, Babylon in the New Testament, specifically in the book of Revelation, becomes the symbol for all idolatry, all filth, all abomination. It stands as the gold standard to all things that are in rebellion against God. Ezekiel chapter 8, reading from verse 1. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house, with the elders of Judah sitting before me, the hand of the Lord God fell upon me there. Then I looked, and behold, a form that had the appearance of a man. Below what appeared to be his waist was fire, and above his waist was something like the appearance of brightness, like gleaming metal. He put out the form of a hand and took me by the lock of my head. And the Spirit lifted me up between heaven and earth and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem. Remember, Ezekiel is currently physically in Babylon. But the Spirit of God takes him to Jerusalem. To the entrance of the gateway of the inner court that faces north. Ezekiel now sees there was, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, like the vision that I had seen in the valley. This chapter for those who want to know where to find the Trinity in the Old Testament. This is a beautiful picture of the Trinity. You have one who is in the form of a man coming to Ezekiel. That is Jesus. You have, number two, the Spirit who plucks Ezekiel and takes him to Jerusalem. That is, of course, the Holy Spirit. And then when he arrives in Jerusalem, he sees the glory of God in the temple. That is, of course, God the Father. But we see we have an image of jealousy. An image of jealousy. According to scholars, this image of jealousy was most probably an image to the goddess Asherah, who was a fertility goddess. But note where this image of jealousy is. It was placed by the Israelites by the atoning altar where the priests would make sacrifices to God to atone for their sins. And yet God is showing Ezekiel, look, they have set up an image of jealousy by my atoning altar. Verse 6, And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel are committing here to drive me far from my sanctuary. And then he says, God, but you will still see greater abominations. Verse 7, he brought me to the entrance of the court. And when I looked, behold, there was a hole in the wall 
And he said to me, son of man, dig in the wall. So I dug in the wall and behold, there was an entrance. And he said to me, go in and see the vile abominations that they are committing here. So I went in and saw, and there engraved on the wall all around was every form of creeping thing and loathsome beast and all the idols of the house of Israel. And before them stood 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel with Jezaniah of the son, the son of Shaphna standing between them. Each had his censer in his hand, and the smoke of the cloud of incense went up. Now, this hole in the wall points to something that Israel was hiding. But we need to remember that nothing is hidden from the eyes of God. And this is the instruction he gives Ezekiel. You see that hole? Start digging. I want you to see. This, in the modern sense, the word occult should come to mind. Because occult means hidden. God is showing the occultic behavior of Israel. And this is uncovered at God's command. According to scholars, this room of pictures is most probably set up as a nod, as acknowledgement to the various cults and pagan practices that Israel acquired through political agreements, political alliances, and religious agreements with the surrounding nations. In other words, Israel imported these things against the will of God. Remember the law of Moses, you will have no other God before me. This is why, while some things were done in the open, other things were done in secret. As far as the incense is concerned, most commentaries will just tell you they burnt incense to hide the, the smell of the animal sacrifice. And yes, that is true, but I want you to understand something this morning. Incense was burnt for one main reason. When you entered a sacred place, before you entered, you would smell the incense. So, as an Israelite, if I'm walking at, in, in the courtyards and I smell incense, when I follow that incense, I know, according to scripture and according to my religious beliefs, that I'm entering holy ground. Understand that this room of pictures, they were burning incense. Israel was declaring that the secret room was holy ground. The only ground that is holy is where the Lord God Almighty is. And yet Israel was making holy ground, making sanctuary to foreign gods. And yet, what do we carry on reading here? Verse 13, he said to me, you will still see greater abominations that they commit. So it gets worse. Verse 14, then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. He said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? You will still see greater abominations than these. Now, this is where when we do our Bible studies, we read women weeping for Tammuz and we just move right along. No, we need to look into the history of these things. Who was Tammuz and why are these Israelite women crying? Well, Tammuz was a Sumerian god. He was the husband to the goddess Inanna. And he was believed to have died. And he was believed to be awaiting his resurrection in the underworld. So these Israelite women were literally crying out in worship 
Offenbar's song for his return. Weeping for Tammuz. Crying out over, for all intents and purposes, a dead God. And yet, God says to Ezekiel, and greater abominations than these you will still see. Now we have the privilege of knowing the righteous branch. Amen. We know that Jesus Christ conquered death and Hades. Samuz is still in the underworld. And people will weep for him until the Lord Jesus returns and he will remain there. And yet Israel cries over a dead foreign God. Verse 16. And he brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord. And if you've noticed, when you understand the layout of the temple, we are moving ever closer to the Holy of Holies. And this is why God is saying greater abominations than this you will see, because as we get closer to the presence of God, idol worship increases. And behold, at the entrance of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men <laughs> with their backs to the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, worshipping the sun towards the east. We need to understand where these men are. They are right outside the sanctuary of God. They are right outside where the Ark of the Covenant is kept. They are right outside where the presence of God dwells to commune with the people of Israel. They turn their backs to the presence of God. We need to understand that in Middle Eastern culture, Turning your back on someone is a sign of disrespect. They turn their backs to the presence of the God of Israel and they face the sun. In other words, they choose to worship creation over the Creator. Greater abominations than these. Verse 17. And he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Is it too light a thing for the house of Judah to commit the abominations that they commit here? That they should fill the land with violence and provoke me still further to anger. Behold, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore, I will act in wrath. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. Yes, Israel had truly turned their backs on God. We need to understand that the temple of God wasn't torn down in favor of foreign gods. Instead, they built all these things around the temple of God. So what Israel did was, they still worshipped Yahweh. But not alone. So they placed God among these strange gods. Among these foreign gods. The question is, is the church not guilty? The global church not guilty of the same thing? Throughout Israel's history, they worship false gods. God punishes them. They come to repentance. And revival takes place across the land. And not long after that revival, they do the same thing. They worship foreign gods. And I'd like to just touch on revival, if I may, quickly. What is revival? Revival is to bring to life what is dead. So how come when Israel was revived, they went back 
to worshipping foreign gods. Because, and this is the lesson for us this morning, when you revive to the Lord, you are only meant to bring to life what is to the Lord. The rest must remain dead. And this is the New Testament concept of water baptism. The old man must die and the new man must rise. So when we pray, Lord, for revival, let's be careful what we are asking for. Are we asking the Lord to revive us based on His Word or on our desires? For if it is based on our desires, it would be a false revival. And I'm sure if you look at the churches around you over the, the last few years, there have been many false revivals. We have a revival meeting. The church is packed. We sing songs. People pray. A message is brought. That very next Sunday, not even half the amount of people are in church. Where was the revival? Because we revived that which should remain dead. But just like the women who weep for Tammuz, we want these things that are dead, that are fleshly, that are sinful, to remain while we proclaim with our mouths the name of God. It is an abomination. Though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, God says, I will not hear them. I believe if we look at the global church today, that we can find several examples of idolatry. And without going through an exhaustive list, I'll touch on a few points. And don't worry, I'll be picking on all the different churches this morning. So we'll start with the biggest church. We'll start with the Roman church, the supposed holy Catholic church. The New Testament teaches us that when Christ ascended, he said, I will send to you a helper, one who will lead you into all truth, who will convict you of your sins. The Comforter, the Holy Spirit, he will be my representation on the earth while I make supplication for you at the right hand of the Father. And yet, the Catholic Church says, no, the Holy Pope is the representation of Christ on earth. And many, many people in that church look to the Pope as someone whose word is on the same level of authority as the Word of God. Church, that is idolatry. That same church teaches erroneously about the mother of Jesus. They pray through Mary. Church, that is idolatry. What about the Protestant churches, those who broke away from Roman Catholicism? <laughs> Many of those churches worship their denominations. We are of John Calvin. We are of Wesley. We are of Luther. Where is God? They will sit and argue over doctrines and interpretations based on the words of men, church, that is idolatry. What about the Western church as a whole? Wealth and prosperity, comfort, church, that is idolatry. Let's look a bit closer to home. Some churches mix Ancestral worship with the Word of God. Church, that is idolatry. Are you starting to see the picture? Then you have churches that mix humanism. What is humanism? Humanism teaches that mankind has the right to shape and give meaning to their own lives without God. In other words, humanism teaches 
that we direct our own course in life. In other words, it is outside the will and sovereignty of God because humanism determines you to be a God. There are churches out there that mix humanism with the gospel. They elevate their status far above the biblical grounding of scripture. Church, that is idolatry. We don't have to have a graven image to be idol worshippers. You see, what the church has done is that we've imported into Scripture, into the Word of God, the doctrines of men and of demons. We hold these doctrines as equal to God's Word and in many cases simply override God's Word. Did the Apostle Paul not warn us of these things? A very famous portion of scripture that we like to quote Hosea 4 verse 6 says my people perish for lack of knowledge my people perish for lack of knowledge that word we translate as knowledge could easily be translated as discernment so it could read my people perish they die for lack of discernment Discernment. You see, much like Israel, we will perish if this is not corrected in the church. We accept all manner of things in the name of tolerance. Goodman, I don't want to offend you. Therefore, I will allow you to bring your idols into the sanctuary of God. Patrick, I don't want to offend you. We need to get along. Therefore, I will allow you to bring your idols into the sanctuary of God. The church has become a toothless dog. The time is coming and is here where we either will stand up and say enough or we will perish for lack of knowledge, for lack of discernment. We desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Understand this. Lord, baptize me in your spirit. I want to speak in tongues. I want to heal the sick. I want to raise the dead. And yet, we cling on to our idols. Where in Scripture do you read that the Spirit of God dwells where there is unrighteousness, where there is foreign gods, where there is strange gods. It is nowhere to be seen. You see, Israel wanted God's favor. Remember I said they didn't tear down the temple of God. It remained. Because they wanted God's favor. But at the same time, they wanted to worship their own flesh and sin. Are we not guilty of the same? And we ask the question, Lord, why won't you use me? Why won't you let your Holy Spirit manifest through me? The question I have to ask is, what idols do you have erected in the house of God? The New Testament teaches that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit dwelling in a temple where there are idols? Because you see later on in the book of Ezekiel, the presence of God leaves the temple. That temple is left desolate. That temple is left to corrode under the weight of these foreign gods. Turn with me please to the first book of Corinthians, chapter 10. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, 
I'll just stop there for a second. How many times in life do you find something out or someone points something out to you and you go, I didn't know that. We've all done that. I didn't know that. No one told me. Well, Paul's telling you now. I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us. Examples for who? Examples for the church. That we might not desire evil as they did, as who did? Israel. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for whose instruction? Our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. Now that is a picture of the global church. We've imported idols into our church. In some cases, there are quite literal graven images or statues. In other cases, it is practices and doctrines and belief systems that we've injected into the Word of God. That is the global church. But what about you? What about the individual member of the body? Do you have idols in the sanctuary of God? I can list various examples. Entertainment, political or cultural figureheads, money, sex, technology, whatever it may be, but what might be an idol for Tyron won't necessarily be an idol for me. So what point is it in listing these things? Instead, what is an idol? Because I have here one, two, three, four, five points that we need, or questions that we need to ask ourselves. And if it's yes to any of these five, you have idols in the sanctuary of God. And by instruction of the Holy Word of God, you are to destroy those idols. Number one, if it keeps you from worshipping God, it is an idol. If it keeps you from worshipping God, it is an idol. Answer the things for yourself. You know what keeps you from worshipping God. If it causes you to sin, it is an idol. Idolatry and sin go hand in hand. If it causes you to sin, it is an idol. If it changes the word of God, if it changes the gospel, if it is another gospel, if something is injected by doctrines of men or of demons into the word of God, and it is something that you uphold and defend, it is an idol. If you put your faith in it, it is an idol. The checkered past of South Africa, the political past, the atrocities of apartheid, we know these things. When 94 came along, the people put their faith into the ANC. Church, if you put your faith into anything other than the living God, it is an 
idol. And it's not picking on the ANC. Pick any political party of your choosing. If you put your faith in it, and it is not God, it is an idol. And lastly, if you take offense to someone pointing out your idol, as I have just done, and as you may have just taken, it is an idol. This is your litmus test. If anything in your life meets this criteria, and there are more, then you have some work to do. You have to clear out your temple. For that is where the presence of God dwells. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So Israel worshipped idols. The church has idols. We as individuals may have idols. Yet we are supposed to provoke the Jews to jealousy. The Jewish people to this day are still idolaters. They read the Old Testament, not for themselves, but under the tutelage of rabbis. These same rabbis have their own writings called the Talmud. In this Talmud, there are many things that the Lord God would see as abominations. And yet, this is the teaching they sit under, doctrines of men, idolatry. In Jerusalem, you have the Western Wall. It's the Western Retaining Wall, which many believe is the wall, the last piece of, of wall standing of the, the Second Temple that was destroyed. The Jewish people used to refer to it as the Wailing Wall. The Wailing Wall. They would go to this wall and they would pray. And they still do this today. Three times a day they will pray at this wall. Because they revere this wall as holy. In fact, the rabbis teach incorrectly, because the Word of God says otherwise, that the presence of God is still among the ruins of that temple. And specifically is found in this wall. That is idolatry. Their worship is dictated by what is called the Jewish Kabbalah. The Jewish Kabbalah. If you have seen any of your favorite Hollywood stars on TV, oftentimes they wear a little red piece of string on their wrist. That is the symbol that they are practitioners of the Kabbalah. What is the Kabbalah? It is mystical interpretation of the scripture. Much like Paul in the New Testament warned of the Gnostics, this is what Kabbalah is, or Kabbalahism is, to the Jewish people. So the worship at this wall, which is an image, where they are falsely teaching that the presence of God still dwells, because it does not, they are being directed by mystics, and writings of men to worship, and they are told that their prayers will only reach heaven if it starts by this wall. That is idolatry. In other words, church, Israel is still practicing idolatry in 2022 for one simple reason. They rejected their Messiah. With this in mind, our last portion of scripture this morning. Turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. We'll just read verse 11 for now. Paul speaking to the church. He says, So I ask, did they, they being Israel, stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, Salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make 
Israel jealous. So we've gone through a whole lot of things for me to ask that question now. Is the church succeeding in making Israel jealous? An argument can be made that in the year 2022, more and more Jewish people are coming to know Christ. But is your own life something for Israel to be jealous over? Remember, Israel are idolaters. How are you to show the Messiah to them, the Messiah that they rejected, if when they look at you, they see a fellow idolater? What provocation do you have to make towards them if you yourself are an idolater? You cannot make a Jewish person jealous or even a Gentile unbeliever jealous if what they see in you is simply a reflection of what they already are. The Jewish people will only be provoked to jealousy when they see their Messiah, whom they have rejected, manifesting in you. This is why we are told in the New Testament to imitate Christ. Not imitate Pastor Jeff or Brother Patrick. Not imitate the Pope. Not imitate your favorite gospel singer. You are to imitate Christ. For when we imitate him, we show the Jews whom they have rejected. When we imitate him, we show the unbelievers why we are set apart, why we are different. An unbeliever cannot look at you and just see more of themselves. No, they need to see Christ. Provoke. Provoke is a strong word. If I provoke you, it is not something done in gentleness, is it? If I provoke you, it is confrontational. If I provoke you to jealousy, it is because you see that which separates marrow from bone, which separates soul from spirit. The word of God divides. What hope do we have in showing the Messiah to idol worshippers if we ourselves are idol worshippers. This is a spiritual truth. The church, you and I, cannot show Christ as Savior to Jew or Gentile if we ourselves worship at two altars. If you think God is not aware of what is going on in His own temple, then you are sorely mistaken. God knows, and church, His Spirit will not work through disobedience. To be truly set apart, to be part of the church, remember the church is the called out ones, the ecclesia, called out of darkness into light, in order that we may show light. In order to truly be set apart, you will always only get one of two reactions from unbelievers. One, they will either persecute you, or two, they will embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior. Those are the only two results. But if you still worship idols in your life, you will only ever produce the first result. You cannot lead someone to Jesus if you are an idol worshiper. Verse 21 in Romans 11. 
For if God did not spare the natural branches, that is Israel, neither would he spare you. Paul says now, note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. Ezekiel 8 ends with, They will cry out to me, but I will not hear them. There's a false teaching in the church today that because we are under the grace of God, that we have a blanket license to do as we please. God is to be worshipped alone. If you worship idols, and you need to answer this for yourself, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will reveal to you if there are idols in your life. If you worship idols, you are running the risk of being cut off from this olive tree. You see, this olive tree, the natural branches being Israel, we are grafted in to this tree. Christ is the righteous branch. It's one tree. Israel doesn't have its tree over there, and the church its tree over there. It's one tree. Paul says these things were written down as examples for us. Israel's hope is the church's hope. Jesus Christ. So let us allow God then to prune us as he sees fit. For only then will Israel be provoked to jealousy. We have a responsibility, church, to destroy all the idols in our lives. Never to be revived again. In this revival, we can show true revival to those who are dead in their sin. Amen. Amen. To summarize all this in one short sentence, in a poetic way, this olive tree of Romans chapter 11, of which Jew and Gentile are one, pruned and ready, will one day be planted in the new garden of Eden to produce holy fruit forevermore unto the Lord. But that is yet future in a poetic sense. For now, our responsibility is towards the righteous branch. Our example is the righteous branch lest we find ourselves cut off. Do not throw away your salvation, and yes, it is between you and God. No, I am not judging you. The Word of God is judging you. If you are guilty, if I am guilty, do not throw away your salvation because of idols. Amen.